introduce Professor Marco Roffi uh, from Geneva University Hospital. He's in charge of the Interventional Cardiology Unit of the Service of Cardiology, and he's going to present us the new guidelines helping us with dealing with the management of patients presenting with NSTEMI. Dear Paola, dear Stefan, uh, it's a pleasure for me to present these guidelines on behalf of the task force. Uh, I have to say I feel uh, somehow intimidated because uh, Stefan Windeck, you may not know, but he was appointed as a chairman of the guideline committee from the ESC. So first of all, I would like to congratulate you, Stefan, for this prestigious and very important uh, position on behalf of our working group, Interventional Cardiology, and the ESC. And please, an applause for Stefan. So uh, this was the task force that worked together for two years. And actually, I have to say that Switzerland was very well represented. Uh, in addition to myself, Christian Müller from Basel, Stefan Windecker from uh, Switzerland, and actually uh, also Marco Valgimigli at the time from the Netherlands, but also now from Switzerland. So really, this was a big effort. And I would encourage you tomorrow to come at 11.30. Here in the same room, we have a dedicated session on these guidelines. So, so now I have the privilege to give you just some few insight to give you the flavor, hoping that you're coming tomorrow. So first of all, we have a, uh, published a new diagnostic algorithm for high sensitivity cardiac troponin in the diagnosis of non stemi You may recall the ESC for the first time in 2011 proposed high sensitivity cardiac troponin as a diagnostic tool for non stemi at that time, a diagnostic algorithm with an assessment at baseline and three hours was proposed. This algorithm is still valid. Now we had one more algorithm based on assessment of high sensitivity cardiac troponin at baseline at, at one hour. So if you have a patient with suspected non stemi if the patient has very low high sensitivity cardiac troponin, we still, we'll still look the detail after, the patient may already be ruled out for non stemi if the pain is beyond three hours. It's very important. We are not ruling out uh, coronary disease. We are ruling out non stemi If the patient comes in with low level of high sensitivity cardiac troponin and there is no uh, significant change at one hour, then the patient can be ruled out. On the other hand of the spectrum, the patient comes in with very high, uh, high sensitivity cardiac troponin level and a clinical condition compatible with non stemi you can rule in the patient. Or if after one hour he has a significant increase, again, the patient may be diagnosed with non stemi In between, obviously, we will have a group of patients that may requiring further uh, diagnostic assessment. So the negative predictive value of this algorithm is very high, greater than 98%. So we can really exclude myocardial infarction with the high accuracy. And the positive predictive value is also good, more than 75% for acute MI. It's very important that the cutoffs for rule in and rule out are SA specific. So this is how the look, uh, uh, the final draft of the uh, scheme in the guidelines. First of all, before looking at the scheme, you have to know whether or not in your hospital you use either this one, uh, this uh, assays, high sensitivity cardiotroponin T elexis, or high sensitivity cardiotroponin I architect. If you are not using them, then please don't look at the scheme because it will not help you. You cannot use it. So again, if you have one of these two uh, essays, then you will be able to put exactly for each of the cases the cutoff value, allowing you to rule in or rule out a patient. So this is very important now because we know that unstable angina patients, so defined as high sensitivity cardiotroponin patient on multiple assessment, are very different from non stemi patient in terms, obviously, per definition of myocardial necrosis, so none in the unstable angina patient and per definition present in the non stemi patient, but also in the risk of death or major arrhythmias, which is very low in unstable angina patient but is present in non stemi patient. More important, the benefit from intensified antiplatelet therapy and early revascularization is much more predominant in non stemi patient compared with the unstable angina patients. So for the first time, we have tried to give you some guidance uh, how you should monitor your patient in terms of cardiac rhythm monitoring, presenting with suspected non st segment elevation acute coronary syndromes. So if the patient comes in with unstable angina, there is no need for a routine 
uh, rhythm monitoring because the patient is very low risk for arrhythmia. Obviously, if he has a recurrence of symptoms, if you think he may have coronary spasm and so on and so forth, you are uh, obviously allowed to monitor this patient. But there is no need for routine uh, monitoring of unstable angina patient. And then we have stratified patients at low risk for cardiac arrhythmias versus intermediate to high risk for cardiac arrhythmias. The first patient at low risk for cardiac arrhythmias defined as stable hemodynamically without arrhythmias, normal ventricular function, good perfusion, no additional coronary stenosis, no complication following PCI. This patient may require uh, rhythm monitoring only for less than 24 hours or for until the time of PCI. So the patient comes in in the ER, he has non stemi low risk, you take it to the cardiac lab, you reperfuse him, the patient may go direct, directly to the ward if you think this is uh, feasible. Patient at higher risk obviously require monitoring, they may, be, may go beyond 24 hours. So with respect to antiplatelet therapy, the basic remain the same, aspirin obviously lifelong, P2Y12 inhibitors, and in this case, Ticagrelor or Prazugrel preferred over Clopidogrel for 12 months for the majority of patients. We'll see the detail later. Again, as I mentioned, as already in 2011 guidelines, Prazugrel and Ticagrelor are considered to be superior to uh, Clopidogrel. What is new, that even in patients that require a drug eluting stent, we may consider, somehow weaker indication, we may consider a shorter duration of dual antipated therapy in the range of three to six months. And a new piece of data is that you may not give Prazugrel in patients that you plan a Cori angiogram because the ACCO study showed no benefit of, of Prazugrel pretreatment in those patients. So uh, why can we shorten the, the duration of dual antipated therapy in patients that may be a higher risk of uh, bleeding? The data actually do not come from acute coronary syndrome trial, but come from stable drug eluting stent trial. Nevertheless, if we compare short-term dual antipated therapy versus 12 months, you see no difference in cardiovascular mortality, no difference in myocardial infarction, but a marked reduction in uh, major bleeding in the range of 40%. So at least in stable patients, this is definitely this sa safe. And for stable disease, the six months duration is already established. In non-STEMI, if the patient had a higher risk of bleeding, we think it may be reasonable to shorten the duration of dual antipated therapy. The second question is maybe go longer than 12 months. Also for this recommendation, for the first time, we open the door to prolong dual antipated therapy beyond one year. But the degree of recommendation is low to be, so you may consider it. And uh, uh, this recommendation comes from a meta-analysis, including the large uh, Pegasus study. And the results I've summarized here, and I think uh, uh, may uh, well explain uh, the weak degree of recommendation. So first of all, if you gave beyond 12 years, 12 months, dual antipathetic therapy, you have a reduction in ischemic events, which is highly statistically significant, Absolute risk reduction, 1.1%, number needed to treat of 90. But there is a price to pay. Increased major bleeding risk, 70%, relative risk reduction, 0.8%, absolute risk reduction, number needed to harm, 125. One may argue that there was in this meta-analysis a significant reduction in cardiovascular death, but the number needed to treat was 300. And in addition, there was absolutely no difference in all-cause mortality. So based on this meta-analysis, we gave this 2B recommendation. With respect to uh, timing of P2Y12 inhibitor initiation, there is no conclusive recommendation that we can say, and the statement is the following. As the optimal timing of ticagrelor or clopidogrel administration in non ST segment elevation ACS patients scheduled for an invasive strategy has not been adequately investigated, no recommendation for or against pretreatment with this agent can be formulated. As I mentioned already, based on the cost result, pretreatment with prazugrel is not recommended. Revascularization, this is a new scheme of the revascularization strategy, modalities and timing in the guidelines. And this may change whether you are in a PCI center or in a non-PCI center, and I borrow this animation from Stefan, if you have a patient at very high risk, defined as you listed here, 
hemodynamically unstable, recurrent, ongoing chest pain, refractory, life-threatening arrhythmias, mechanical complication of MI, acute heart failure related to ACS, or recurrent ST segment elevation intermittent, this patient needs to be treated like a STEMI. So if you are in a PCI center, you should take this patient to the lab within two hours. If you are a non-PCI center, you should transfer the patient immediately. Intermediate risk, uh, high risk patient, these are classically the non-STEMI patient. If you are in the PCI center, you have 24 hours time to take this patient to the lab. If you are a non-PCI center, you should transfer this patient the same day. Intermediate risk patient, this, uh, you have more time, 72 hours, the list of the characteristic is described there. And if you're a low risk patient, then you might consider to go to the lab or not to go. And if you're in a center without uh, PCI capability, you may want to do a non-invasive testing. So the next important point is that for the first time we have recommended radial approach uh, to be superior over the transfemoral approach for the treatment of ACS patient. This is based on the matrix study, large study, 8,000 patients, STEMI and non-STEMI all together. If you look, all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction or stroke, superiority of the radial approach over the femoral approach. And obviously, if you include the bleeding complication, the benefit is even greater. Marco Valgimigli, who was, was uh, pre uh, participating in these guidelines, made also a meta-analysis published in The Lancet 2015 looking at all the trials who have randomized patients with ACS to transfemoral or transradial approach. You see, on the left side, the radial axis, you see the benefit in terms of non-cabbage major bleeding, 40% relative risk reduction, reduction in death, MI or stroke, and also, in very important, reduction in death at 30 days in the range of 28% relative risk reduction. Based on this, uh, evidence, we gave a class 1A indication for the transradial approach in ACS. Drug eluting stent are the treatment of choice for the vast majority of patients, and for the first time, even in patients that may require only two, uh, four weeks of dual antipathetic therapy based on high bleeding risk, for the first time we said that this may be used also drug eluting stent. The last point I want to approach with you is that the management of patients requiring oral anticoagulation and at the same time having acute coronary syndromes. So the easiest part is the patients are medically managed or require cabbage and they are on AFib, require oral anticoagulation. This patient requires dual therapy, meaning one antiplatelet and one anticoagulant. Antiplatelet can be aspirin, can be clopidogrel, anticoagulant can be a novel anticoagulant, can be a vitamin K antagonist. For this scheme, this is always meant like this. So dual therapy for up to one year, followed by oral anticoagulation only. If the patient undergoing PCI, you have to assess his uh, bleeding risk. If the patient is low to intermediate bleeding risk, for example, has blood score two or less, then we recommend triple therapy, defined in aspirin, clopidogrel, and one anticoagulant for six months, followed by dual therapy, aspirin, and one anticoagulant, aspirin or clopidogrel, and one anticoagulant up to 12 months. If the patient is high bleeding risk, for example, has bled greater than three, triple therapy for one month followed by dual therapy, or alternatively, initially starting with dual therapy, one antiplatelet, one anticoagulant. After one year, we recommend monotherapy with anticoagulation, leaving the door open for patients at high ischemic risk to continue one antiplatelet agent. With respect to the stent to be used, obviously, in this column here, drug eluting stent. In this column here, in the guidelines, we said drug eluting stent or bare metal stent, but now follow with the result of the leaders free study published by Philippe Urbain in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think there is no more place for bare metal stent. One word about long-term prevention, just mentioning that for the first time, we said that the inpatient with LDL cholesterol greater than 70, despite the maximally tolerated statin dose, further reduction in LDL cholesterol with a non-statin agent should be considered, based on uh, the very recent trial with the zetimibe. So for the time being, this is true for a zetimibe. In the future, new agent may come in. And I would like to finish with the, this slide for the one who are interested. We, at the same time, we have published three documents looking at uh, case, and, uh, case description, question and answer format, Diagnostic and risk assessment, antithrombotic therapy, 
coronary vascularization. So if you are interested, you may go on this website. So far, this has been quite liked. In six months, we had 23,000 downloaded for this question and answer uh, papers and over 260,000 downloads for the non-STEMI guidelines. And I thank you for your attention.